Justice Rustronen from the Economic Court. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm going to try to begin where Justice Strine ended, and I'm going to uh, talk about the business judgment rule. Actually, the Israeli version of the business judgment rule. So a lot has been said and written about the rule. It was mentioned in many American cases, and it was implemented and ex explained in uh, Delaware case law. <coughs> there is also a lot of academic writing about it, and this conference is always a good opportunity to see the faces behind the names that we read in court's decision and in law review articles. So thank you, Zohar, for inviting me. <laughs> Uh, I think it's quite safe to say today that the business judgment rule is part of Israeli law. However, the exact scope of the rule, the conditions for its implementation and such related questions have not yet been fully answered by our courts. District courts and especially the economic division of the Tel Aviv District Court are therefore required to deal with presidential dilemmas and to gradually shape and develop Israeli corporate law. It's naturally a step-by-step -step process which will at some point will probably get to the Supreme Court. I'd like to begin with a comment about the business judgment rule as a non-interference rule. Non-interference rules are not strange to Israeli case law. The Israeli case law has a non-interference rule regarding decisions of administrative bodies. According to this rule, courts will refrain from interfering in decisions made by administrative executives so long as their decisions fall within the scope of reasonableness. The rule, however, is different from the business judgment rule. According to the administrative non-interference rule, the standard of conduct required from the administrative body is identical to the standard of review applied by the courts, which is reasonableness in both cases. According to the administrative rule, the court will not replace its discretion with the one of the decision maker and will not interfere with it even if the judge believes that if she would have to make the decision in the first place, the decision would have been different. To give a numerical example, if the court estimates that the scope of reasonableness is between 40 and 60, the court will not interfere with the decision of 40, even if to the judge's opinion the right decision should have been 60. But the court will interfere with decisions that are below 40 or above 60 because they fall outside of the reasonableness scope. The business judgment rule, on the other hand, is a much wider non-interference rule and therefore may be confusing and strange to Israeli case law and to the Israeli legal tradition. According to the business judgment rule, upon the existence of several conditions with, that I'll talk about later, the court will not interfere even with decisions that are not reasonable. And therefore, the court will not interfere, in the numerical example I just gave, in decisions of 30 or 70 or in decisions of 20 or 80, and it may ev even be argued that in, facts, in fact courts do not and should not ever interfere with business decisions made by non-interested directors, at least as long as there is some rational explanation to the decision and that it cannot be considered as waste. In the word of Justice Allen, the former Chancellor of the Delaware Court of Chancery, whether a judge or jury considering the matter after the fact believes a decision substantively wrong or degrees of wrong extending through stupid, through egregious or irrational, provides no ground for direct reliability so long as the court determines that the process employed was either rational or employed in good faith effort to advance corporate interests. So implementing this rule by Israeli courts therefore may require a uh, certain amount of self-educating uh, and, and the development of new working habits and manners of thought that will enable us to validate even unreasonable, stupid or egregious decisions. Uh, as we know, according to the business judgment rule, the court will not interfere or will not second guess the contents of a board's decision so long as it was an informed decision and that the directors were acting in good faith and did not have any conflict of interest. So the implementation of the rule therefore requires to analyze separately each of these factors. Good faith, no conflict of interest, and an informed decision. And I'd like to, to briefly discuss each of the factors later. Uh, the first condition, as I said, for applying the rule is that the directors did not have a conflict of interest. 
According to the business judgment rule, courts are hesitant to second-guess the business judgment of a disinterested and independent board of directors. One of the rationales of the business judgment rule is that the market can better monitor directors' decisions and possible negligence than courts. When we are dealing with a company which is run by a controlling shareholder, which has the in incentive for the company to generate profit, we can assume that he can be trusted as far as supervising the directors and replacing them if they are consistently negligent. Therefore, inspection by the court is unnecessary. However, in cases of self-dealing, when the shareholder's personal interest differs from the company's interest, the shareholder's incentive change. In these cases, we cannot therefore assume that the controlling shareholder will correct the deficient board. Hostile takeover is irrelevant as well when the company is controlled by a controlling shareholder, as are most of the companies in Israel, and the court's intervention may therefore be necessary. However, it has to be noted that the question whether directors were or were not in a conflict of interest situation is not always simple to answer. The reason is that there is always a personal interest uh, of the decision maker. If we presume all decision makers will always put their own personal interest first before the collective interest, there could, be, there could be many vague cases, like cases where directors act in order to protect their existing control of the corporation, cases where the question of whether or not the directors were in a situation of conflict will be far from clear and open to many interpretations. Uh, the second condition of the business judgment rule requires the board's decision will be an informed decision in order for, the pro for it to be protected by the business judgment rule and presumed as reasonable. Several conclusions can be drawn from this requirement. First, in order to apply the business judgment rule, there has to be a decision of the board. A decision is a positive and clear action. A board's decision has to be made by the relevant organ, the board of directors. When there is no decision, we cannot presume that the board acted in a reasonable manner and that it should be protected under the rule. This conclusion is mostly relevant in cases where it is argued against a company's failure to take, to take a certain action. In such cases, the board may decide to refrain from action or it may decide to address the issue again at a later stage. These are positive decisions. However, in a case where the board refrained from making the decision, its action or inaction will not be protected. The reason for that is that we cannot assume that thoughtless omission or oversight, where there is no specific decision, has to be protected by court. Moreover, the decision has to be a result of a process. The process has to involve informing the relevant organs with the relevant facts and information, weighing those facts and their expected results, often asking questions and making inquiries, and then reaching a decision while taking all of the above mentioned factors into consideration. If such a, sp a process has taken place, the court will not second guess its result and will not interfere with the relevant weight that has been given to each of the conflicting factors. Courts will not interfere even when to the judge's opinion, when checking the decision retrospectively, the decision was not a reasonable one. What then is the decision-making process that the board has to go through in order for its decision to be protected by the business judgment rule? The answer, of course, depends on all the relevant circumstances. A process regarding a minor decision is not identical to a process regarding a major substantial one. The necessary process, when there is a time lim limit requiring a quick decision, may be different from the necessary process when there is no time pressure. The necessary process when the company has funds and can finance expert opinions for the board's member may be different than the required process when the company lacks proper resources to do so. This leads us to another conclusion, that in order for the board's decision to be protected by the business judgment rule, it has to be reasonably informed. The question asked is whether and to what extent should the court examine the amount of information that the board members should have had before reaching their decision. The dilemma arises because the line bec between examining the content of the board's decision and examining the board's process which led to the decision is not always bright and clear. Usually it's not. For example, there may be different reasons for the board to decide not to use an expert opinion before reaching its decision. One reason could be the company's financial situation and the price of such an opinion. 
Another reason may be time pressure. The directors may estimate that the other party may not wait and sign an agreement with a different company, and so they, they may want to take a, quiz, a quick and less informed decision. Uh, one possible solution to the dilemma is to apply the business judgment rule over the board's decision not to get an expert opinion, being a decision that balances different considerations. As such, the court would, would presume the decision is reasonable and would not second guess it as well. So I think the judicial review uh, of the board's decision should consist of several steps. First, the judge has to find out what is the required information necessary for the directors to reach a decision. As far as this stage is concerned, the court has to consider what is the optimal amount of information. If the board settled for less information, the judge has to find out whether the decision not to insist of having some relevant information was an informed one. When a decision is based on missing information, the board has to explain why they did not have the required information before reaching the decision. If the board decided that the information was unnecessary, too expensive or time consuming, this de decision would be protected under the business judgment rule. And so will the board's following decision on the subject matter. However, if the board unconsciously failed to reach the necessary information due to the board's laziness or negligence, its failure will not be protected by the business judgment rule and so will its following decision on the subject matter that cannot be considered an informed decision. The Delaware Court's decisions in the case of Walt Disney derivative litigation sets a good example for that dilemma. In August 1995, Michael Ovitz was appointed to serve as the president of the Walt Disney Company. His presidency didn't last long, and after 14 months only, Ovitz was terminated without a cause. According to his employment agreement, Ovitz was paid severance in the amount of approximately $130 million. As a result, several shareholders brought a derivative action in Delaware court on behalf of Disney against Ovitz and the directors who served at the time. The defendants filed a motion to dismiss the derivative action based on the business judgment rule. The Delaware Court of Chancery, Chancellor Chandler, chose not to dismiss the action despite the fact that the board was not in any conflict of interest. The Chancery Court ruled that, as far as that stage of the hearing was concerned, and according to the facts as argued by the plaintiff, it cannot be said that the board reached an informed decision. The court stated that the directors used an ostrich-like approach regarded, regarding both the terms of the agreement of Disney with Mr. Ovitz and the terms of his retirement when he left the company. The board failed to review possible alternatives and to consult with an expert or a legal advisor. The court emphasizes, though, that had the board taken such ex actions, the court would not have interfered with its decision in according to the business judgment rule. The conclusion is, therefore, that the court is entitled to use an objective criteria in order to decide what is the relevant information which is necessary for the board's decision to be considered as reasonably informed. <coughs> and what should the decision-making process look like. The court may check whether the board actually had this necessary information and whether it went, through, it went through the required process, taking into account all the relevant circumstances. In the Disney case, the Chancery Court ultimately dismissed the derivative action in a decision that was affirmed by the Supreme Court. Uh, the court used the business judgment rule and decided that despite the fact that the decision-making process and its documentation was far from ideal, there is no room for court's interference. In my opinion, courts should try to predictate for future parties what is the procedure that if followed would minimize the chance of court's interference. If there is such a procedure that the court counts on, it will approve decisions that were made using that procedure even if in some cases those decisions are not to the court's opinion ideal. We have to remember that the mere option that the court may review the contents of the board's, board's decision in some cases negates the appeal or the magic of the procedural rule as far as the company is concerned, since the appeal of the rule is mainly the promise of immunizing the decision from future interference. It should be noted that some of the considerations that are usually mentioned in, fav in favor of the business judgment rule are not relevant, relevant when the court is reviewing the procedure rather than the content of the business decision. 
It is common to say in this context that directors are in most cases more qualified to make business decisions than our judges. While this statement is true when we're talking about the contents of the business decision, I think it does not apply to the procedure of making the decision. On the contrary, judges are very well qualified to set decision-making procedures and they have the relevant experience and expertise in determining the procedure and inspecting that it, it has been followed. The fear that directors will not make innovative and risky decisions, but rather will stick to conservative ones, is also mentioned to justify the business judgment rule. We want directors to sometimes take risks or to try new directions, and they might not do it if they fear they might be held negligent in cases of business failure. However, if the court sets a procedure that when followed strictly may immune the decision from future judici judicial review, it may enable the directors to be innovative and to, to make risky moves as long as they do it after considering all the relevant factors and balancing them according to their discretion. The decision of how to balance the different factors is for the board to decide. As a general rule, if the board wishes to protect its decision, it is best to document the procedure that preceded it. The Delaware court referred to this issue in the Disney case and, that, and said that has there been full and complete documentation, there would be no dispute and no basis for litigation over what information was furnished to the committee members and when it was furnished. The best way to prove what the contents of the board's meeting in which the decision was made is by looking at the minutes. Detailed minutes are a very good way to ensure the court will not interfere with the decision. However, this is not the only way and the, co and the contents of the meeting can be also proved by other evidence. Some cases mention in this context the fear that directors may speak only for the record. Personally, I do not think there is ground for such a fear. I believe that the process in which the directors are faced with all the relevant facts and in which all the risks and chances are mentioned, discussed and put into writing in the, minutes, uh, meeting, in the meeting's minutes, such a process serves as a guarantee for a better outcome. Such a procedure assures us that all the directors were aware of all of the relevant facts and that they have considered and weighed them without disregarding any of them. Such a procedure also assures that the board would make sure it has all the reasonably available information, that they asked questions where it is necessary. In case the, there is information that is missing, the directors will find out why it is not available and whether it is possible to furnish it. What happens if the court concludes that a certain decision was made without the board having all the reasonably available information? Such a decision will not be protected by the business judgment rule and will not, will not enjoy the presumption of reasonableness. The burden then shifts to the defendants, the directors, but what do they have to prove in order to avoid liability? One possibility is that the standard of review will be entire fairness. As much as I know, this indeed is, or at least used to be, the standard according to Delaware law. However, it may be argued that the standard should not be entire fairness. When the directors breached their fiduciary duty, since they were self-dealing and acting in a position of conflict of interest, it makes sense to raise the standard of review and to require the directors to prove that the terms of the deal are entirely fair. On the other hand, if the decision does not enjoy the protection of the rule just because the directors were negligent in the process of making their decision, the standard should remain the regular standard of care and the directors should only prove that their decision was reasonable. That would have been the situation has there not been a business judgment rule and the directors would have been accused of negligence. The existence of the rule and the decision that in a certain, certain case the directors cannot enjoy it should not change the standard of review. Moreover, a decision that was reached in a situation of a conflict is a very suspicious one. The decision maker has to prove that despite the fact he was negotiating with himself, the terms of the contract are entirely fair. There's no similar suspicion when dealing with a decision that was reached without strictly following the correct procedure, assuming the directors were disinterested. Uh, as we know, and as Judge Shrine just mentioned, the Delaware case law uh, discussed the possibility of applying the business judgment rule in the case of self-dealing. 
It offered a procedure that, if applied, can immune the decision from court's interference. Similar efforts were made by us in Israeli courts. What I'd like to discuss is a subcategory of these cases of uh, conflict of interest, the category of a demand by a shareholder to the company to, use its, uh, to sue its directors. The board in such a case is obviously in a conflict. The obvious presumption is that no one would decide that he or she breached their duties and that the company should sue them for that reason. However, attempts were made to craft a procedure that would prevent the court from interfering with such a, such a decision as well. It requires the company to appoint an independent committee that will decide whether the company should or should not accept the demand to sue the directors. Can such a committee ever make a positive decision, decide to file a claim against the present directors of the company? What should the court check regarding the, check regarding the procedure in order to approve its conclusions? Can there be a situation where the company strictly followed the procedure so that the court will not second guess its conclusion and will not attempt to reevaluate the contents of its decision? Should this situation be treated differently than other situations where independent committees are appointed by the company in order to avoid self-dealing? A different treatment could be justified because the conflict of interest in this situation is so obvious. Because the question is a binary yes or no question, to sue or not to sue, rather than what should be the fair value of an asset, what compensation to, should be awarded to the controlling shareholder, etc. And also because regarding such decision, it cannot be said that the judges are less qualified than, than directors. On the contrary, judges in general are more qualified to evaluate the chances of a potential claim. And the specific judge dealing with the derivative action is most qualified because he or she will be the judge that would eventually have to decide the case in the derivative action itself. So could the court, despite of all of the above mentioned considerations, give guidelines to a procedure of appointing an independent special committee, a procedure that if fully applied will ensure the company that the court will not interfere with its decision? When the board decides not to sue a third party, which has nothing to do with the present management of the company, I believe such a decision of the board should be protected by, by the business judgment rule and that the court should not interfere with it, despite the fact that the court has tools to review the contents of such a decision. The reason that is that the company should have full discretion of deciding whether or not to go to court, taking into consideration all relevant factors, the chances of winning, but also the price of going to court, both time-wise and money-wise, the possible harm to the company's reputation, the future relationship of the company with the potential defendants, and so on. Should there be a difference between such a situation and an independent committee's decision regarding the possibility to sue the directors? In any event, I think that the possibility of appointing independent committees in self-dealing cases will shift the focus of the battlefield to the discovery proceedings. The more emphasis will be put on procedure, information, and review of process, the question of documentation that will enable the court to review the process will be of greater importance. Reviewing the process, rather than the contents of the decision, requires discovery. Where an independent committee is involved, there has to be complete discovery regarding its nomination, its powers, its remuneration, the possible influence of the controlling shareholder, the expert it's consulted with, the questions that were asked. The goal of the defendants would be that at the end of the preliminary process, the court can decide that the procedure was followed and that therefore there will be no interference with the contents of the decision. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, these are only a few preliminary thoughts of issues that were dealt with and will be dealt with our court in the future. The law is still being crafted by us. We sometimes look outside to compare with the experience of others and there's st certainly still a lot of work to be done and it's certainly going to be interesting. Thank you.